This seismic profile comes from offshore Tunisia and we can use it to explore ways in which we can interpret faults on seismic profiles and then to calculate the dip of the faults that we interpret. So we're going to pick two faults on here and then having done the interpretation in two-way time, for that is how this display is shown, we're going to then assume seismic velocities and then use some simple trigonometry to calculate dips of the faults that we see in the profile, in other words the apparent dip of the fault planes. Right, so let's start off, here are the two faults we're going to pick and we'll start off with the one on the right. And I always think it's useful to start in the shallow section where the seismic image quality is highest. So we'll start off picking a reflector here that I've picked out in green and we can see that we can trace it along but it's also been offset across discrete features which we're going to assume are faults. And we can see in the case of the right hand fault the left hand side is down thrown in the way indicated by the half arrow. Well let's keep pushing our interpretation to depth and again we can pick a horizon here that I picked out in blue and again we can do the same with a light green horizon and another horizon at depth. So we can correlate discrete horizons through this part of the profile even though they're broken and we can use these breaks to identify faults and the sense of displacement on the fault like this. And we can maybe see another couple of small faults. We're not really going to consider them in detail, but we can pick them now here. And we can push the continuity of our main fault to deeper in the profile, perhaps like this. So let's turn our attention now to the fault that will continue into the subsurface by the left hand of our two red arrows. And we can maybe correlate our reflectors that we've already picked over into the middle part of the profile again offset across a zone and we can perhaps infer that the zone represents a fault that splays upwards towards the red arrow and the earth's surface something like that and the sense of movement shown again with the conventional half arrow again it's a fault down thrown to the left the faults are inclined to the left so they're normal faults with the hanging wall down therefore down towards the left hand side of the profile So let's ask the question now, what's the orientation of this fault? What's its dip, or at least its apparent dip, in other words, the dip as seen in this profile? Well, to work out the inclination, the dip of the fault plane, we have to measure the vertical distance and the horizontal distance over which we tracked it. In other words, the distance between those two yellow blobs as set up uh, in the diagram in the inset. So we can see, in this particular inset, we traced our faults for a distance of 2.2 seconds two-way time vertically over a horizontal distance of 2.6 kilometers. We can do the same for the left-hand fault here, where this we've traced for a depth distance of 2 seconds two-way time, and it achieves that depth difference over a horizontal distance of 3.5 kilometers. Now, this is in two-way time. To look at what their real orientation is, we have to convert the vertical scale from two-way travel time to depth. In order to do that, we need to assume a seismic velocity. Well, actually, a smart thing to do is assume a range of seismic velocities to get a range of values for what the orientation, the dip of the fault plane might be. We're going to use two seismic velocities and assume that the real velocity lies somewhere between these two values of 4 kilometers and 5 kilometers per second. Regionally, we believe these rocks are carbonates, so those are the seismic velocities we'll use. Right, so let's work these in turn. So, if we convert the diagram we've got there on the left-hand side, where two seconds of travel time converts to four kilometers as shown. In contrast, we can set up the same velocity structure for the fault on the right, 2.2 seconds two-way time converts to 4.4 kilometers using a seismic velocity of four kilometers a second again. Now let's do the same thing for the seismic velocity of five kilometers and this is how it works out. 
the horizontal scales obviously remain the same. We're not changing the horizontal distance. That remains in kilometers. The travel time, two seconds for the left-hand fault, becomes five kilometers in depth if we use five kilometers a second. For the right-hand fault, our 2.2 seconds of travel time becomes 5.5 kilometers of real kilometers in depth. So now to calculate the apparent dips of these various scenarios, we need to use some simple trigonometry. So let's do that for the scenario on the left-hand side there. So a four kilometer per second seismic velocity converts our two-way time to four kilometers of vertical over a horizontal distance of 3.5. And we want to calculate the dip. So the tangent of the dip is simply 4 divided by 3.5 and that works out at 49 degrees. So the apparent dip of our fault plane using that seismic velocity comes out at 49 degrees. So we can use the same approach to work out the dip for all the other scenarios that we've got shown on the screen. And here they are. So our fault on the left, if we have a seismic velocity of 4 kilometers per second, then the fault has an apparent dip of 49 degrees, but if we increase the seismic velocity to 5 kilometers per second, its apparent dip is 55 degrees. If we use our seismic velocity of 4 kilometers per second, we have an apparent dip of 59 degrees. If we increase our assumed seismic velocity to 5 kilometers per second, the fault dips at 62 degrees. So we put ranges on the apparent dip of our faults by applying a range of seismic velocities. These are, of course, average dips. We just joined up two points, top and bottom of our fault. If the seismic velocity varies with depth and just has an average value, then the fault will have a more complicated geometry and may have variable dips. So this just gives us an approximation for the dip of the fault, but it's still better than dealing with our two-way time. So that's how this plays out. Left-hand fault has a dip of somewhere between 49 degrees and 55 degrees. The right-hand fault somewhere between 59 degrees and 62 degrees. A simple illustration of how to calculate the apparent dip of fault planes by assuming seismic velocities. We've also seen, in order to get to that point, we had to interpret the faults, and I've shown you a quick way of doing that, starting near the surface where the seismic resolution is good, and pushing down into the subsurface. We work between picking reflectors that are stratal in origin, and picking a bit of fault. Moving back to pick stratal reflectors, push the fault a bit further. So you iterate between stratal picking and fault plane interpretation to build up our structural interpretation.